sort of teachings going to start now. Rangina, could you, for those who weren't here earlier, on Rangina, we left it at the end of the worship about talking mountain high and the picture that Rangina saw. So we, oh, I've asked Rangina to expand on that. There was more to it than what she told you. Okay. Lots of us love mountaintop experiences, don't we? I love them. <laughs> You go up and I've never been on a really high mountain, but I've been on hills and you look out and it's beautiful, isn't it? And with God, when we go on a mountaintop experience, it's high, it's lovely. We talk about it, we tell everybody how lovely it is and we, you know, we've got this inside of us anyway, this high that we feel um, because God is with us there and he's done so many wonderful things for us while we're on this mountaintop. And then some of us then down in the valley. And what happens when we're in the valley, we think God is not with us. That we're there, we feel depressed, we feel awful, and we think we're all alone, nobody's with us. And we go through this experience thinking that nobody cares, we don't really matter, and, and we feel really, really down because we're in this valley. But what I want to say today is that God is with us, regardless whether we're on the mountaintop, we're in the valley, God is there and he's going through, or we are going through what we're experiencing with him at that time in the valley. Um, and so many times in that valley, we experience things that really and truly sometimes it's better than the mountaintop because when we come out of it, we know that it was only God who can actually bring us through that valley. Because nobody else could have done it because the only person we could have really relied upon was God. And really today, I think lots of us go through valley experiences and think nobody's there. And personally, and I wasn't actually going to say this, but um, <laughs> I know personally what it's like um, to go through that. And then when you're going through it, you don't even want to pray. You don't even want to speak to God. At least I didn't. When the worst time was when I knew my sister had cancer. And I couldn't speak to God. For days and days, I couldn't speak to God because of where I was going through. But the truth came back to me that God is going through this. We're going through it with him. He allows things to happen. We don't know why things happen, but he allows them to happen and we come through that. Um, and certainly, it, okay, it didn't take very long for me to <laughs> realize, yes, that it's only God who can take us through what we're going through then at that time. But it's to say that he is there and he's never going to forget us and he's never ever going to leave us alone in whatever circumstances, whatever experience we're going through at the time, God is there. The same as same God that's on the mountaintop giving you really lovely and high experience is the same God there in the valley going through that with us. Yeah. O oh Lord, you've examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts, even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to the heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are 
there. So let me ask you, is that a God who abandons and makes you and disappears? Is that a God who abandons you? Is that a God who is not, sorry, is there a place that you can go that God isn't there? Okay, some of you are saying no, some of you are shaking your heads. So let's, let's do this a bit better. Is there a place that you can go that God isn't there? Is there a place that you can go that God isn't there? The reason I've repeated it for a third time is then let's ask the question, why is it, therefore then, there are moments where we just suddenly think God has abandoned us? That God is suddenly not present. Where does that come from? Think for yourself for a minute. Why do I go to those places? Rangina was really honest. She didn't know she was going to say what she was going to say. But what makes us... Think for yourself for a minute. This is a, sort of one of those sermons at the moment. That just think for yourself. Why do you go there? What, what, what's, what, what goes on in your thought process? I think it's the devil taking control of our thoughts, um, not taking control, but giving us these thoughts because the ultimate goal of the devil is to separate us from God. So he would do anything and use any little thing within our lives where we could falter to say, oh, God's abandoned you. God doesn't care about you. That's why you're in this situation. Okay, thank you. It's one Reason? Um, she's right, spot on. Also, in addition to that, we are human. Um, and human nature being what it is, we will always be human. And that's why God said in the scripture that, for my strength is made perfect in your weaknesses. In our human capacity, we are very weak. I'm very, very weak. But if we allow God to come in, and take lordship of that situation, then his strength will be made perfect in a human nature. Thank you. Brenda. Just going on from the ladies, what they just said, just expanding on that a little bit. I think it's our own selfishness as well. When a situation is really desperate, we tend to go, no, it's, I can do it. And you forget about God. Because you're so self-absorbed, I guess, or selfish in the sense that you don't believe God's gone ahead of you and you don't believe God's actually there with you for that moment. Thank you. Also a very honest and true answer. And also following on for what everybody else has said, I also think when you believe wrong, you live wrong. And when you believe right, you live right. So when you go to the scriptures and you read who God says you are and you start speaking that over the situation. Situations are always going to come up in our lives. But I think God calls us to speak God's words instead of what the problem is. And as we speak God's words, we will feel a, um, a peace within. And that will connect us back to, and remember, Holy Spirit is there with us to remind us of who we are in Christ. So I got you to walk around to say to each other, God is with you, is speaking it over you. Uh, talking of belief and what everybody else has said, maybe faith not strong enough. One's faith not strong enough. And then asking God to um, make my faith strong, uh, kill my unbelief, as they've said before here. Yeah. yeah, God, unfortunately, makes our, when we ask, make my faith strong, he puts us in situations to test our faith. So um, that's never the, uh, the happy moment, but that's what come, the fruit that comes out afterwards. Thank you. Um, sometimes we want a um, quick answer, 
We want it's like, like it's like a magic. We want it to happen instantly, and um, God does not work the way we work, and um, so we just tend to forget it's not happening instantly. So we we're trying to look for a quick answer in our head and forgetting God. So then we think he's abandoned us because he hasn't given us the answer when we want the answer. Okay, doesn't that sound like a child to a parent? You've not given me what I want and I want it now. You clearly don't love me. Any parent ever had that said to them? Any child ever said that to their parent? You know what I've been through. I'm not going to go into it. Um, And I started feeling despondent and in the slough of despond, (laughs) like in the Bunyan book. Um, But the picture that came to me was Jesus Christ on the cross. And when he said, Father, why have you forsaken me? And we all feel forsaken. He came and he was our example of how to live as Christians. And it's okay to say that you feel forsaken so that he can step in. It's not about our works and what we can do for ourselves. It's about us being weak and letting him be strong. Amen. Michael. Hang on. Let me go, because Michael's had his hand up desperately. And Marcella, you seem to be very happy with Eva. A lot of it is how we perceive our relationship with God. Because if we know that he is trusted and we can have an intimacy with him, it doesn't matter when things go wrong. There is always be the trust that I am down here. I feel like rubbish. But my, my father, my dad is always with me. I think sometimes we think that as a way to rationalize things. If God is all-powerful and wants me, wishes well for me, and I'm going through this thing that is so bad, it could only be that he is not here to see it. So maybe we think that sometimes as a way to try to rationalize how could this be happening. That's cool. One more? Have I got one more somewhere? Sorry, the words that are coming to me are compassion because I think it's so easy to have that critical, that parent, well, you haven't prayed enough. You haven't got enough faith. And I don't believe when you're down there that God really wants to say that. Very true. Thank you. Some very good honesty. Thank you. Yep. Me, I think sometimes when things don't go right, when I struggle with my problem, not disability, I feel that God is not with me. And I feel that the devil is trying to say to me, come with me, my son. But I will not do that because I know God has got me by the hand and you will keep me away from this person. Thank you. Oh, the more this goes on, the less sermon I've got to do. <laughs> a common theme that I keep hearing is the feeling. When I feel down, I feel forsaken, I feel low, I feel, and it is one of the things that the devil can use quite easily. We are human and we feel. And one of the things that you keep hearing as well is you can't rely on your feeling when you're low. You can't rely on how you feel at that moment, but it doesn't mean you don't feel it. Um, I think the best example for me is Elijah, powerful prophet, and felt absolutely forsaken after one of the most brilliant victories in the Bible. And he felt alone. But that word of compassion that someone spoke about, when God appeared to him, he said, look, you're tired. Have something to eat, have something to drink and now understand who you are in me. And that's the bit that we need to remember. We are a family, and we will feel it. And that's why it's so important when you are feeling low, and you're feeling down, that we recognize and we reach out. When you feel like somebody has laid someone on your heart, go and speak to them. Go and encourage them, because you are that person that God is using when they are feeling low, to remind them, look, God is still with you. God is still going through it with you. Oh, I was just going to hand you the mic. (laughs) 
like the thing is, so like when we're going through bad times, like we might see it as bad because we're limited by human logic, but in God's world, He's in a higher order of logic. So even though all we can see is bad in His world, He can actually see the bigger picture, whereas we can't. So He can actually, so it might actually be overall good, but we won't be able to see that till later on when He shows it to us in future. I was going to hand you the mic as well. So I'll just hand everybody the microphone and just leave you to keep preaching. Um, Fiona, yeah, keep going. I know that in the past when I've been feeling really low, um, I know I use the word feelings, but there's no way, you know, you're in the blackness and you're kind of like, you cannot see a way out. And sometimes it's the easier option to just say, I can't be bothered to do anything. I can't face this today. And so you give in to that voice. And really what you need to do at that point is if you can, is reach out to your family. That means come here on a Sunday and quite often when you start going, when you start thinking things are going slightly wrong, see what your Sunday attendance is like. That's not having a go at you, it's just the first clue that you have that something may be going wrong and you need to contact with your family. So, you know, other people are saying that, you know, you know my story, I feel that my story is fairly well known as well. The other thing is sometimes you feel like a broken record. I went through a situation with a bad boss for almost 10 years and I was kind of like coming up every Sunday for prayer. Loads of people in the church knew about it and they prayed for me. Broken record, it happened again. I got a new boss and it happened again. Different outcome this time, but if I hadn't gone for it the first time, the second time, I wouldn't know how to deal with it the second time. And that's really hard to hear when you're a Christian and you're going through an awful experience and saying, what do you mean it can happen again? But there's light. And when you're in the darkness, it's easier to close your eyes. Perhaps when you've got your eyes closed and you're enjoying the darkness, finding, find that light within you that is God for you and know that you are loved. Know that it is love, 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 and love is all. Amen. Amen. I think sometimes we feel that uh, because we uh, are Christians, we are children of God, uh, we believe that uh, nothing bad will come, um, will come, will happen to us. Uh, but God never said that. God never said that because we are His children, nothing bad will uh, happen to us. However, we know that um, God is always present in the good and the bad times. And what he promised us is that he will walk that journey with us and that he will be with us. He will give us strength, as someone had previously said. So um, the lie is, oh, because I'm a child of God, uh, nothing bad will happen to me. God never said that. Actually, it promises that bad things will come as to us in the Bible because we are children of God. hate to tell you that. It's one of the things that I realised early on in my Christian walk. I thought, I've been told a lie. More rubbish is coming my way. <laughs> when I became a Christian, isn't. It's just that we're more consciously aware of it because we are children of God. I'm going to be really honest with you. The sermon for this morning, I did not have other than three words. Presence. 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 That was it. That's all I had. I all, that's all I had because God sometimes does that with me. Um, really is annoying. Um, I feel like I'm in the valley at Saturday night because I don't know what I'm doing today. But God wants to talk to us about the fact that he is present with us in everything. So it wasn't until this morning I looked at the worship that I had actually felt God came from God. That It's all talking about being in God's presence. It's about being in his presence. It's about actively choosing to worship God and be in his presence. And the fact that God is present with us. Now, we, we worry about feelings, and it's true we are human. And what that means is actually we've been designed with feelings. 
Yeah. We've actually, you've actually been designed by God to have feelings. Because how can you experience joy of the Lord unless you feel it? How can you experience, was it the joy of the Lord is my strength? Well, how do you have that joy of the Lord? Is by being in his presence. And there's nowhere you can go that you are not, he is not. So you're always in his presence. Our problem is our feelings, the negative ones, kick in. But they are part and parcel of our package. As humans, designed by the Lord. Isn't it annoying? Why didn't he remove all those, those, those feelings of despondency? Why did he not remove the feelings of sadness? Why did he not remove the feelings of lowness? Why did he not do that? Well, they weren't part of the original plan, but they will always be able to be in us because we're made in his image. And believe it or not, God actually does get angry. Not the way that we get angry, but he gets angry. So it's part of feelings. Jesus felt. He both laughed. I know it doesn't say it in the Bible, but Jesus did actually laugh. Sorry, ever been, to, ever been to a party where there seems to be somebody there who's the most miserable what's it that you've ever met in your life? Who, when you're, in, when you're in their presence in that room, they just seem to pull the whole of the atmosphere down. You're all laughing, so you've been there, yes? So do you think that Jesus at the wedding of Cana was a miserable what's it? No, because you wouldn't go up to him or his mother, would you? And the mother gives it, do as he tells you. Oh, okay, we'll do as he tells you. He obviously must have been a bit of a fun guy. Because if he was fully human, it means he had laughter. It means he would have had a joke. Actually, there are probably some moments in the passage, especially where uh, Peter starts sinking in the sea. And he sort of says, where is your faith? Actually, we sometimes see that as him having a go at it. But actually, if you look at the Greek, it's probably him being a little bit ironic. Oh, come on, Peter, man. Where's your faith? That sort of, yeah? So um, our Lord Jesus was fully human. So both, not only did he weep, the famous English translation of Jesus, what, Barry? Jesus what? What, what, Barry? Sorry? Thank you. Barry taught us in our house group a few months ago on that, on that whole thing. He did a brilliant talk about Jesus wept. Jesus cried and Jesus laughed. He had the whole range of feelings. We have feelings. So it's okay to say, this is how I feel. But how we feel is purely an indicator of how we are feeling. What the truth might be and what's going on is completely different. So we might feel like God has abandoned us, but I think the Lord is saying, well, I know the Lord, I don't mean to think. The Lord is saying, no, I haven't. I am with you. My presence is with you. I am with you. If you're on the mountaintop, hallelujah, praise the Lord. If you're down in the valley, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Because either way, the Lord is with you. The Sermon on the Mount, blessed be. So blessed are the meek, kingdom of God. Blessed are those who fight after justice and they see mercy and all that. Blessed, yeah? Sorry, I'm sitting there terribly doing that. Let me do that again. Let me do that a little bit better as a pastor. The NLT says it slightly different. It says this, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Oh, that's good. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. By the way, I just want to make a quick clarification. It does not mean that your hearts are only pure because Jesus makes it pure. Not because you work to purity. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called children of God. 
God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of God is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Was there a promise of a happy, happy life? But what was the promise? That God blesses you. How can God bless you? He can only bless you if he is present. So God is with you. God is with you. Now what happens on the flip side of this is partly our responsibility now. It's called the relationship. Have you heard about the relationship? A relationship is a really amazing thing. When you have a relationship with someone and it's a really good relationship and it's a loving relationship and it's a relationship that's dealt upon mutual understanding of each other, that's quite amazing, isn't it? I think relationships are brilliant, yes? Be they marital relationships, be they friendship relationships, be they children to child relationship, be they God parent to God children relationship, whatever kind of relationship. On a good side, they're a good relationship. And it's a relationship, I don't know about you, but I really like my relationships with people that I have. Do you like your relationships with people you have? You know, not all relationships are brilliant. There are some ones that really I don't want to be involved in, thank you very much. But we're not talking about those, we're talking about the good ones. So when you have a good relationship with someone, what do you normally want to do? What do you want to do? Spend time with them. It's amazing, isn't it? You want to spend time with them. When your good relationship with someone's going well and they're down in the valley, what do you want to do? Do you want to spend time with them? Do you want to avoid them like the plague? Do you want to spend time with them? When you're down in the valley, what would you like them to do? Okay, so, so let's take that for a minute on the human level and then let's take that to God. Somehow, when the minute we say the word God or Lord, we seem to suddenly make this massive leap of separation. Oh, spending time with God. Mm. Now, I need to prepare myself for this. I need to somehow clean my hands, wash my feet, clean my face and get myself fully prepared. I must make sure I'm in a quiet, dark room somewhere. have got my Bible open and I've just listened to good Matt Redman, holy music. That's how we tend to think of initially. That's the first thing that pops into your mind when you're thinking about spending time with the Lord. Now, there are times and places for that. Because we have to recognize he is Lord. Sorry, just a quick sideline. I do make me laugh that some people say, well, oh, he's Lord. And then when I say to them, well, did you, did, you know, when you talk to people and you realize they're in a dis- situation or, or a decision that they made. And I said originally, did you actually ask the Lord about that? Oh, no. But he's in charge. Well, if he's in charge, you should have asked him in the first place. Does that make sense? Anyway, that's a sideline. Moving on. So, relationship. So, I don't know about you, but when you're seeing your friends, do you, do you go and decide to put on some good, holy Matt Redman music, um, sit in a holy corner, uh, reading your Bible first before you go and see your friend? No. Some people don't even bother getting washed and dressed. You don't. You just say, well, it's me, mate. They're coming round, isn't it? They know what I'm like. You're in tracksuit bottoms or something. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. But some people just say, welcome to the house. Do you spring clean the house? Some people, if it's your closest friend, you do not spring clean the house from top to bottom, do you? Do you? They're closest friend. They know you really well, and they know what you're really like, and you know what they're really like. So they sort of just pile around, and they're just there, aren't they? And they just take you as you are. Why do we seem to have a problem that God will not do the same? 
Does your closest friend see you on the toilet? I, I'm asking the honest question. Does your closest friend see you doing your bits in the toilet? No, but guess who does? And he still takes you as you are. So the point I'm getting at is that we somehow sometimes when we're going through the valleys or through the mountaintops, we seem seem to think we have to pre-prepare ourselves to meet with the Lord. But the problem is he knows he's already there. He already is there. So I'm sorry, but he saw you when you got up first thing in the morning. He saw you blow your nose and he even heard your loud fart. But he knows that you're there. And he said, yes, whether you like it or not, folks, I know we don't like this idea of maybe someone saying, you're talking about the Lord. Yes, I am. And he's still there and he still loves you. And he's loving the relationship. You can't hide anything from him. And that's a brilliant thing. Because he still loves you. And he hasn't abandoned you. The Lord is saying, I am present. And I want that continuing relationship. Now, I, in my early years, when I first got um, my rheumatoid arthritis, there were moments where I just did not want to talk to anybody. Even my own loved one sitting over there. Just, I'm just too angry. I'm just too miserable. I'm too much pain. I just don't talk. I just can't talk. I don't want to talk. Did Joy walk out the room? No. So I'll answer that for you. You don't know the answer to that because you're not God and you weren't there. But she was present, even in my silence. And she was comforting without actually saying anything. And that was probably a good thing she didn't say anything because I probably would have bitten her head off. It, arthritis, if you, it, it, it makes you sometimes erratic initially for a while. You're in a lot of pain. So sometimes with God, you can sit there and say to the Lord, Lord, I'm too miserable. I just don't want to talk. But he's still there. Does that see what I mean? The relationship is still there. It hasn't gone. It isn't like afterwards when you start coming out of that. You start thinking to yourself, okay, oh, oh, Lord's angry with me because I said I don't want to talk to him. Because I'm in so much distress. God is not like that. I think it's Derwin put it really well. He's not like that. He understands. He's still there. So we get in the point that God is present all the time, everywhere, wherever you go and whatever you do. Yes? Yes. Okay. This is the bit. I think God's saying, but I want the more intimate relationship. The more open up yourself to me. Allow me in more. Let's have that more and more deeper relationship not to work for anything not to achieve anything but for the relationship for relationship sake your closest friend I bet you'd like to get to know more and more about them don't you you like to get even deeper with them discover more about them and you after even many years you find out something really new about them you didn't actually know a lot of you did not know I like country music did you a lot of my closest friends didn't know that neither. I'm not saying they're all happy about the idea. But, and so with the Lord, it's the same. The more we spend time with him, the more we get that intimate, we get to know more about him. And more importantly, we actually discover how much more he loves us. So, how do you do this presence with the Lord? Well, you don't have to spend two minutes in a holy dark room praying to him every three minutes. You can do it walking around. You can do it listening to country music. Yes, the Lord is in country music. 
You can do it watching TV. You can do it reading everything. The Lord is present anyway. And he just forever wants to talk and for us to talk to him. So to finish it off, presence, presence, presence. The Lord loves being in your presence and you being in his. So don't let any lies from Satan convince you otherwise. Don't let your own human frailty convince you otherwise. Let the Lord and his word, especially Psalm 139, convince you. He is present and with you. Amen. So, no, moment, Martin. Sorry, just a minute. Do you want to bow your heads for a minute? Well, actually, no. Could you please stand? Sorry, what am I saying? I'm falling into that trap of let's, this is how we do it. Please stand. Talk to God for yourself in however you want to. So if you want to walk around the back at the moment chatting to the Lord, recognizing his presence, go ahead. If you want to sit, kneel, lay down, jump up and down, do whatever. The Lord is with you. Izin has got something. Um, morning, everyone. Afternoon now. Um, but uh, as we were speaking about the part on the at the beginning, um, like a poem that I wrote a while ago came to me. So I'm just going to share it with you guys. There is no place so desperate that you cannot find me there. I am the air in the bottomless pit, the depths of your despair, and I live even in your tears, and I love more than your pain, and my heart aches when your heart aches, but your heart will be whole again. It's not just your desperation that I know and understand. I know this whole earth bleeds, my people wounded. I hold them in my hands. I hear the sighs escape as you suffocate and you try and hold it together. My church should never doubt that I know pain. I have known pain since forever. I felt the nails on the cross and I heard my son's cries, but in the depths of that despair was born eternal life. So when you sit and think about how my church should cope with strife, the pain that comes as part of life in this fallen world, this fallen country, this fallen community, you must believe there is no place so desperate that you cannot find me. Amen. That's just Marcelo just plays I feel there's just time for us to respond we do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation to learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv